right, my friends. I just pressed the let's go live button and we know what that means. The tubes have to connect themselves all across the fruited plane of the internet before we can go ahead and get started. Sometimes they don't connect themselves. That's not good for yours truly. Sitting here blabbering, woo, woo, watching the watchers and nobody's on the other end. I feel like a doofus, but it's working today. That's tremendous. We got some business to attend to, so let's get into it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Judge Juan Mershon from New York. The criminal prosecution against Donald Trump is getting spicier and spicier by the day. Now, Donald Trump has filed a pre-motion. Remember, the judge said, you have to get my permission before you file motions in my courtroom. And so Trump has now asked for permission via a pre-motion to recuse. He almost knocked this microphone off the table. To recuse from this case because his daughter, is a Democrat operative who's been raising, you know, $100 million, give or take, for Democrats. And so this one is fresh out of the oven. Pre-motion to recuse coming out from Todd Blanche and the defense team extraordinaire on behalf of Donald Trump going into Judge Juan Mercan's courtroom saying, hey, Judge, your daughter is a partisan hack and you're a partisan hack because you guys talk about Trump and you're conducting the prosecution of him and she's your daughter so there's a problem with that and so we're going to get into the motion and then of course we'll see what some reaction looks like from people like Eli Honig and the crew over at CNN who are just you know it's just like a joke it's like what kind of analysis is this they just play patty cake with themselves but we'll watch some of it so we can see what they're talking about and then of course What we're seeing here is this new translation. You know, we hear this all the time, protect democracy, protect democracy, protect democracy. What does that mean? It means that they can do whatever the hell they want. They can censor you. They can spend you to death. Well, we have to protect democracy, so uh, money for Ukraine. Okay, I guess we have to save democracy. You know, so they can change and rig elections so that they can prosecute political opponents. All of it's done in the name of protecting democracy. Well, that violated a lot of our civil liberties, obviously in the name of so-called protecting democracy, even though they're they're the ones wrecking it. But they're doing the same thing with administration of justice. So you're gonna hear this new phrase, this is all about the administration of justice or the orderly administration of justice or due process and justice. Well, okay, it's the same stuff. It's just, it's a different layer of the same methodology. Administration of justice, it's a threat to their exposure, to being exposed for their corruption. So we'll talk about that. Then we're gonna dive in on a little bit further on this gag order because the judge did ultimately expand it. Yesterday, we left off on the show talking about the pre-motion response from Trump, and Trump has submitted his full response, and then the judge just turned right around and said, you lose. So we're going to read through both things, Trump's expanded, uh, Trump's opposition to the expanded gag order, and then the judge's actual new gag order, which is where he includes his own daughter, who's a partisan hack. So we'll see that. Now, Trump is pushing this thing, right? So You'll notice this, his pinned truth as of whenever I took the screenshot was a clip from Fox News. And people are saying, did he violate the gag order already? Right, this is what Drudge was saying, idiot. So he's over there and he's saying, what's the gag order? Did he violate it? Are we gonna arrest him again? Remember, Andrew Weissman we heard yesterday was saying, this is a violation of his bond, you know, and all this stuff. So they're freaked out about Trump now continuing to sort of talk about the daughter because what he did is he just shared a video of Brian Kilmeade who was talking about the daughter, okay? So we're gonna read the gag order. Is Trump allowed to share videos of other people talking about the daughter? I I think maybe he can. We're gonna read the order and you'll be the judge of that. So we'll go through that and see what's inside. Trump reacted to the gag. We have the new gag, the old gag, lots of gagging going on. Seems like it might be a thing that Mercon is into, who knows, just gagging everybody in his life. We've got the opposition from Trump. We've got this great piece from Julie Kelly, who writes over at Julie underscore Kelly too, who has a piece on Shifty Adam Schiff. So we'll take a look at that, who clearly worked with the judge's daughter. We always uh, like Julie Kelly's work. And a lot of people have been doing some great work on this. Laura Loomer's been doing some awesome work on Judge Wamer Khan's daughter. We talked about her stuff yesterday. 
or mentioned her yesterday. She's got a lot of stuff that we have not talked about that I'd encourage you to follow, but really good work. So we'll talk about this one today. And then we got George Conway, who sounds like a demented psychopath as he shows up on MSNBC calling Trump a psychopath. It's just perfect. And look at this. Okay, this is the Chiron. This is George Conway's official title when he shows up on MSNBC. Conservative lawyer, George. Right. That's what they put on MSNBC. We'll watch the clip. Give me a break. All right, so that's from George. We've also got this interesting clip that came out during the disbarment proceedings of Jeffrey Clark. This is Mark Wingate talking about the Fulton County votes. And this is an interesting clip. And I know other people have done some great work on this. This is a recent clip, but I think Molly Hemingway uh, included this in her book. And there's been, you know, there's been more exposure to this, but this was a recent clip that just came out and it was from Jeffrey Clark's disbarment hearings. He has been disbarred, right? So that's another attack vector. De-license all your political opponent's allies. That's a pretty nice attack vector. Not, don't, don't only attack your opponent, but go after anybody who supports your opponent, like, you know, reinforcements. So get rid of them. So we're going to go through this because this is interesting. Mark Wingate was appointed to this board, Board of Registration and Elections. And I dug up some documents on this. And... We'll see when he was appointed and lay some foundation because he was also sending emails back in the right in the thick of 2020, right after. You can see this one, November 29th, right after the election. And these emails from Richard Barron, who's the guy who was basically, you know, uh, the governing figure of the authority there in Fulton County. He's sending exchanges with this guy, Wingate, back in 2020, saying that the whole server is basically wiped out, right? So anyways, Wingate comes out, the, the Dominion servers that were there in Fulton County, saying this guy's flying out from California, we're gonna get all this fixed immediately, blah, blah, blah. So we'll see what's going on there, and then we'll listen to this testimony. It's about 15 minutes, give or take, and it's quite good. I'll see if I can keep my mouth shut through it, but it is Jeffrey Clark who is, I'm sorry, Jeffrey Clark was disbarred. This was occurring during his disbarment proceedings, and so they brought this fella in, Wingate, and Wingate is basically supporting the investigation. He's saying, look, all, like there were serious problems here, okay? That's why Jeffrey Clark and Trump and Giuliani and Powell and Ellis and all these people were investigating it, because there were problems by their own admissions. So we'll get into all that and see what's inside. The whole election, of course, uh, was just totally, totally not what they said it was. So... We've got three good segments today, my friends. It's a beautiful Tuesday. I hope you're having a great start to your week. We are grateful to have you here and with us. This morning, we had a very nice members-only stream. We were talking about how Hunter looks a little bit more cracked out these days, how Joe doesn't know that he declared Trans Day of Visibility. We talked about gardening today, actually. That's you know, very exciting. I'm pretty excited about that. So uh, you know, growing your own food, you know, food at home, essentially. That was a fun conversation. And we poked around, we saw what Trump was up to, and it's a great way to start our days, our mornings, and to get our heads on right is to connect with each other at the start of the day, watching the watchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning for our members, YouTube members get, a, get that as well. And we also have Saturday streams. So come and join us and stay connected. They say loneliness and disconnection is literally killing you. So come join us. It's not even expensive. Come check it out. Watching the watchers.locals.com. Links are in the description below. Also, all PDFs, newsletter, calendar of upcoming cases. We call it our watch list. The watcher watch list is over there. The calendar. RobertGovea.com is where you can find it. Also have our merch store. You can access the mind maps that we go through there. Tons of bells and whistles over there. And so go check it out. RobertGovea.com. And of course, WatcherLodge.com which is where we got some cool stuff cooking, which I should have ready to share tomorrow. So we got all that in the descriptions below, link down below, and thank you for supporting us any way that you can. All right, now, without any further ado, let's get into it because we've got a bad judge that has to go. Donald Trump files the pre-motion to recuse Judge Juan Mercan from the case in the Alvin Bragg prosecution taking place in New York. Trial right around the corner, April 15th. We are ready to go to cover that. But the question is, is the trial gonna go? We know that there are a lot of questions about the judge's daughter, Lauren, and the fact that she has worked for numerous Democrats, you know, like Kamala Harris, who happens to be the opponent of Donald Trump, oops. So that means that we have questions about the judge's bias 
and whether he can be impartial throughout this entire trial. And of course, we've already seen the judge and in our opinion, come to the conclusion that he wants Trump convicted immediately, which is why he's making the rulings that he is that are all seemingly adverse to Trump. But the question now is about recusal and whether he's going to stay on the case. So we're going to take a look at what Trump is asking for. Remember, this judge has already now gagged Trump twice and told him, you can't talk about my daughter, even though you know she may have raised $93 million for people like Adam Schiff and others. But it is something that is totally outside of this case and not even relevant to the administration of justice in my courtroom. It's beside the point, never mind the fact that it is someone working against Trump, who happens to be his daughter, okay. And who's also talked to her, and daddy has talked to daughter about this, where they talk about Trump's tweets, as we talked about in a prior show about the podcasts. So this is the pre-motion to recuse. Okay, Trump has had enough, all right? Trial is right around the corner. Trump said, enough of this judge, we've had it. April 1st, this one goes in to the honorable pff, Juan Mercan, judge, Supreme Court. Trump's defense, this is a very short filing signed by Todd Blanche, who's a Nicholas, Blanche Law, says, all right, dear Judge Juan, says, Your Honor, we respectfully submit this pre-motion letter because the judge said you have to get permission slips before you file motions in my courtroom. Lawyers, before you say anything, got to get permission from me. I'm saying, what? That's weird. Because we're actual lawyers, you know? Like, we just file motions. But he doesn't want the motions to hit the docket and all of the dishonesty that is being alleged by the defense to be splayed across the internet for all of the public to see. So here they now get into this. The defense from Trump says, Your Honor, all right, we respectfully submit this pre-motion letter seeking leave to file a motion for recusal. So we would like your permission to file an actual motion. Pursuant to judiciary laws based on changed circumstances and on newly discovered evidence. Remember, they've already asked for Juan to be recused from this case, and that was denied. They said, here, in August 2023, when we asked you before about recusal, Judge Juan reasoned that recusal was not warranted because President Trump had presented, quote, only speculative and hypothetical scenarios. The court said, oh, I've made up. I haven't seen anything about my bias or my hackery at all. Come back when you got some evidence. Guess what? We're back. Knock, knock, knock. The scenarios identified by the defense have come to pass. They said, we told you about this. We warned you. We asked you to recuse yourself. You didn't. You said, come back with evidence. We're here. Your Honor, President Trump is the presumptive Republican nominee for president in a 2024 election. And your Honor's daughter is an executive and a partner at Authentic Campaigns Incorporated. Now, I also want to pause on this briefly. There is a lot of actual misinformation that is out there that I believe is being thrown out by the left to just throw muck in the water so that you can't really see what's happening here. Like, for example, we know definitively that that X account, the previous Twitter account, was the judge's daughter. All right, now the court says, no, it's not hers, and we lost control of it, and someone else is posting there. What? Right? They didn't even say any of that. It was like, we don't, it's not ours, whatever. All right, we know that it is the judge's daughter. At least I con conclusively believe that based on the evidence that I've seen from Laura Loomer's account. And go take a look at it. You can see the picture of the judge's daughter standing up, giving a speech at a tech conference, where the sign behind her says Lauren Mershon and then puts the X account link there, right? Hey, follow me here. So it's her, right? But the court comes out and they kind of, kind of didn't, maybe it was hers at some point, but now it's not hers and we don't really know whose it is now. And so it's all, so then the news takes that and it's all fake. It's all fake. It's all, you know, no, 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 no. Okay. So there's a lot of misinformation, whatever you want to call it. And I think it's intentionally trying to defend this judge and his hacked daughter. Now, this is being submitted not in an article, all right? This is being submitted by two lawyers who are licensed and are officers of the court, right? So this is not like a blog post somewhere. 
They're saying, look, this is our research. This is what we found. And what's so insane about this is this is going to the judge. It's going back to the judge himself, Judge Murkan. Saying, Your Honor, your daughter works at Authentic Campaign. So he's like, yeah, that's true. I get their Christmas cards. Bah. Here's to another year of success, grifting off the government and, and re-contributing that to Democrats, whatever. So as recently as February and March 2024, that is last month by just a few days, authentic campaigns where your daughter is an executive Authentic has used social media to market its connections to President Biden and to VP Harris while deriding President Trump, judge's daughter, executive at a company that's slamming Trump. Fun. Now, Authentic and your honor's daughter called Lauren are making money by supporting the creation and the dissemination of campaign advocacy for President Trump's opponents and his political rivals and the Democrat party. Now it can no longer be ignored, says Trump's defense, that Authentic's, your daughter's, commercial interests are benefited by developments in this case that harm President Trump's penal interests and divert his efforts from running his leading campaign from the presidency by requiring him to prepare and to sit for trial during the general election. So VP Kamala and Shifty Adam Schiff and others are pushing, right, theoretically, pushing money to Authentic. Authentic is making a ton of money. The daughter's being benefited. And the judge is working in the court of law in the same interest as the daughter and has an actual you know, both have a benefit from Trump being undermined. And there will be people that say, Rob, you know, it's a daughter, okay? It's very disconnected. And you say, well, what kind of father are you, huh? If you wouldn't do something to benefit your daughter, like you're not going to run an errand for a friend if it's going to help your daughter out in the long run or whatever it is. Like you don't do things to support your daughter. Do you do things against your daughter's interest? Huh? I don't even have a daughter, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't do that. So you work in conformity with your family interest. We already know the judge is biased because he, he apparently has complained to the daughter, this daughter who talked about this on a podcast, that he didn't like Trump's ex posts. Didn't like him tweeting, said that they were unbecoming of the presidency. Now, here is the defense. They say the trial in this case will benefit authentic, the judge's daughter's in authentic company financially by providing its clients with more fodder for fundraising. They've already been grifting on the back of this. Trump's being prosecuted finally. Uh, America's being held to account, but there's still a danger ahead. Trump might win and we need your funding to help us win. Authentic will make more money by assisting with those communications. And your honor's daughter, Lauren, will continue to earn money from these developments by virtue of her senior role at the authentic company. Now, the ethics opinion that this court relied on to deny our prior recusal motion, it emphasized the ethics opinion said, quote, we see nothing in the inquiry to suggest that the outcome of the case could have any effect on the judge's relative, the relative's business or any of their interests. Okay. Now, the court declined to share its inquiry. Don't even know what that was. We see nothing in the inquiry. And so the defense is like, what? What inquiry? The heck are you talking about? Don't even know what you're talking. So they, in, I guess, investigated it. Now the court declined to share what the inquiry was, but they basically said that if the judge finds Trump guilty, it doesn't benefit the daughter or something. Now the court declined to share how they came to that conclusion, but any such omission can now be addressed. doesn't matter how they got it. Let's talk about it now. According to filings with the Federal Election Commission, Authentic, the judge's daughter's company, has received millions of dollars in disbursements from entities that were associated with Trump's political rivals since the indictment was returned. Millions. Now, some of those funds were paid to Authentic by entities associated with legislators and PACs that have used email and social media 
to solicit contributions specifically based on this case. Okay, so th like this criminal case with Judge Juan. Thus, there is strong evidence that Authentic has used this case to make money. They write email campaigns, right? They market to raise funds. So they reference the case that daddy's on and then raise money on the back of that. How inappropriate can that be? Now, those benefits and the ongoing financial interest cannot be ignored, right? Again, it's the same conflict. If Judge Juan Mercan dismissed this case, well, then there goes their fundraising opportunity, isn't it? Gone. So how can he do that to his daughter when they're literally making millions of dollars that were associated with Trump's political rivals that all have an interest in a stake in Trump being prosecuted? They are salivating to say that Trump is a convicted felon. They're like, oh, it's any day now. He's definitely going to happen before the election, all these clips. Now, compounding these issues, Judge Juan imposed a gag order on Trump that restricts his ability to engage in campaign speech. He can't engage in it, and we can't receive it. And the court is considering expanding that prior restraint further. Of course, they have done that now. Now, in addition, the file appears to have made extrajudicial comments about the case while failing to rule on a pending defense request to file a motion for an adjournment, which we read here, based on pre prejudicial pretrial publicity. We read through that filing, if you missed it, it was a good one. They went through, they said, I mean, look at like, look at New York, and they went through demographics and vote, they, they did uh, surveys on different constituencies, and it was just brutal. Everybody has already heard about Trump, everybody already thinks he's guilty, it is not, there's no way you get a fair trial there. So the, the judge, in other words, is leapfrogging this, the court appears to have made extrajudicial comments about the case while not even ruling on our request. Now, apparently this comes from the Hill. The court battles Trump. Yeah, the court responded. Remember, the court responded and said that that's not our daughter's account. That's not, not hers anymore. We don't know what happened to that one. Yeah, right. So last week, the court used the Office of Court Administration so Judge Juan is now in cover-up mode because they know they're busted. So he's, he's going to gag Trump from talking about it, but we're not stopped stop from talking about it, to issue a statement relating to an ex account used, quote, at some point by your honor's daughter, right? Yeah, it was hers. Now, they agree, right? It was hers. Now, as public scrutiny on these issues has increased, strangely, the account in question appears to have been close to the public. Huh. And so, too, has Authentic's X account. Weird. So the criminals are covering up the crime, thereby limiting Trump's ability to investigate these issues. Just like when we saw Angeron move the cameras in the courtroom around, right? You know, I don't want to see what he's doing with his law clerk there. She sat on the same bench with him. You know, we couldn't really see their hands. I don't know. So right next to each other throughout the entire trial. Strange. So the judge is now gagging Trump and, the, and using other entities of court administration to spread their propaganda and their fake news to try to mu muddy the waters. Now, under these circumstances, Trump's defense says, your honor has an interest in this case that warrants recusal, judge, you gotta go. Under the rules, there is an unacceptable risk that the court and your family relationship will influence your judicial conduct. Because if you dismiss this case, then your daughter is not gonna have opportunities to write email newsletters for Adam Pencilneck, who was censured, by the way. Wonder if she includes that in her little notes. And the court's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Absolutely. And so therefore, President Trump respectfully requests permission to file a motion in support of these arguments that includes briefing and evidence by Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. So, Judge, we want your permission to file a more substantive recusal motion. Do we have it? Yes or no. Signed by Todd Blanche, Susan Nicholas from Blanche Law, and of course, BlancheLaw.com is where you can go find some of their work. Now, they try to cram as much as possible into this one motion, 
right? Very clear. Trump's team is signaling clear. We know she worked for authentic campaigns. We got it, right? That's something that we feel confident in and you know, saying to the court, saying that they've made millions of dollars in money for entities associated with Trump's rivals and that the court is now acting as a propaganda arm. I'm sorry, the court administration office is now acting as a propaganda arm of the judge himself, right? Like the judge's personal interests about his judge, about the daughter of the judge, not even the judge, right? Not talk, this is not a statement about the judge. This is a statement about the judge's daughter, huh? That the judge is now co-opting other court institutions to advocate for on his behalf. So that's a conflict of itself. Did he get permission from the chief justice? Is that is that it within judicial ethics for a judge now to be protecting his daughter, to be acting as the PR wing for, for authentic in their account? They can deal with their own response, all right? Why is the court clarifying that? So now they're trying to figure this out and the defense is saying, Your Honor, enough already, right? You should be recused and we'll see what the judge says in response. So of course, we're gonna be covering this. Hopefully we get the permission to at least see the next step from Judge Juan Mercan. But here's Eli and CNN. Now they play this game of patty cake where they sort of you know sit around and just support each other and the judge, yeah, judge is great. He's doing a great job. Yeah, whatever. And I want to go through this because I was listening to this. It's just ridiculous. But watch what happens here. They're going to say that Trump being gagged is still something that protects Trump's free speech, even though he can't talk about that daughter at all under the new gag. And you'll listen here to this woman. She'll say that Trump made a true social post and then Eli is going to come out and say, see, he still has free speech. But none of them or Trump are mentioning the daughter, which is the elephant in the room, or as we can say, the Democrat operative in the room who is not allowed to be talked about. Here's CNN. I think Donald Trump's post just now is exhibit A as to why the gag order is perfectly fair and appropriate because in this statement that we just saw from Donald Trump, he goes off. He goes off on the judge. He goes off on the charges against him. He says it's unfair. He says people are biased against him. And you know what? Under the gag order, he's allowed to do all of that. He didn't have to hold anything back. He went on an angry rant and that's allowed under the gag order. What's not allowed, what is now off base and should be off base is attacks on jurors, on witnesses, on court staff. And now as- Wait a minute. So he can't, so, so- he can't attack Michael Cohen, but Michael Cohen can attack him. And they're going to point to this statement. See, Trump has a ton of free speech, but Trump isn't allowed to talk about the daughter, as you'll see in that statement. ...of the expanded order on family members. So there are boundaries here. Donald Trump can say quite a bit, as he just has done, but he can't step over those lines. And I think it's a perfect example of why this gag order is both necessary, but also fair and respectful enough of Donald Trump's First Amendment rights. And, and just fact check this part for it. I cannot talk about the corruption and conflict taking place in this courtroom with respect to the <laughs> to a case that everyone and then he goes on. Yeah, incorrect because he just did it and he's allowed to do that. I mean, what Donald Trump. Is so they're saying, see, that's enough. You can just say it's corrupt. Just say it's corrupt. That's enough. So your statement that there is corruption going on perfectly. See how much free speech you have. So generous of Judge Juan Mercan to give you that. And they say that. No, 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 my friends. Free speech is the only mechanism by which you can root out the corruption in the judiciary, right? That's why we have it. It's why it's the First Amendment comes before the Fourth, Fifth, and the Sixth. Because when the state is corrupt, you have to you have to expose it to have a correction in the system, or you've got to rally people to your plight, to your cause, so that you can change the system. Either there's a correction in the court, or you rally Congress people, right? You rally your citizens to protest this case and act accordingly, right? Vote to change the system, change the laws. So everything they can talk about, everything except the only thing that matters, which is the judge's personal bias with his daughter.
is allowed Thanks, to guys. do under the gag order is to say essentially what he just said. He is perfectly within his rights to say, this judge is biased against me. He's perfectly within his rights under the gag order to say, this case is unfair. He can say the DA has bad motives. What he cannot do is say things that endanger the process beyond that. He cannot attack jurors, can't attack witnesses, can't attack the daughter's judge. So again, I think it's a nice example. The trick before the judge in any gag order is balancing the defendant's First Amendment rights. You do have broad First Amendment rights with the need to run an orderly trial and protect the process. And again, I think this posting, as aggressive as it is, I think is a, is a very good example of why the gag order strikes the right balance. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It strikes a balance that serves the government, serves the judge, because Trump is not allowed to talk about and expose the corruption of his daughter. But you heard there at the end when he's saying, you know, we're striking this balance between the administration of justice, the order of the courtroom and so on. And this is the exact same thing. It's just a different application layer. So they come up with these institutional phrases, you know, protect democracy. And then that is their excuse to rig elections, to, you know, lock you down, whatever, to spend money that we don't have, to, you know, the list goes on and on. We got a whole list of things. To censor you is the big one to shut you up to protect democracy. This is dangerous to democracy. And so the government is now enabled to protect democracy. What does that mean? Whatever they want. Same thing with administration of justice, okay? The same thing is happening with Trump. They are censoring him. Administration of justice is the new protect democracy for our terms here. They are allowed to censor. They're allowed to prosecute. They're allowed to get unlimited funding. They're allowed to, uh, like, a. Uh, orchestrate political attacks all in the name of the administration of justice. Trump gets gagged. Trump gets censored. Meanwhile, Michael Cohen can go run his mouth all day long. Jack Smith gets endless government funding. Meanwhile, Trump has to raise funds and many people have to support him all across America, right? They get to prosecute people because they hold the prosecutorial power. And it's all done in the name of orderly administration of justice. It's the same thing. It's the same scam. So we're going to see here what happens with this. The judge, of course, is not going to recuse himself. That is not going to happen. Now, the next question, we'll see whether or not the judge grants more briefing on this or just declines that. I think he'll probably just decline that and say, this has already been ruled on. Already heard this before. There is not a change in circumstances. And so don't need to hear about it again. Thanks. Case is closed. We'll see you back here on April 15th for trial. Now, Trump is going to start appealing different things, and we're going to see if he can get a stay in place before the trial starts. But if this judge has anything to do with it, he is not going to move this trial date, right? The Court of Appeals, just like they did with Judge Chutkin, is literally going to have to come and take it away from them and say, you are done now. It's ours. So we'll see if that happens. I am not so sure that it will. You know, we've got, we're now in New York. We're not in the federal courts. So we'll see what happens, but we're, either way, we're going to be here covering this, my friends. Trial is right around the corner, and so thank you for subscribing. Thanks for liking this video, inviting someone you know or love to come over here and join us when we go live, and so that they can see what the heck is going on here with Judge Juan Mercan and his Democrat daughter. We appreciate you checking out some of the links down in the description below and becoming a member at watchingthewatchers.locals.com where we have member-only streams in the morning. We talk about a bunch of other stuff that we can't get to here. We have a great community. We'd love to have you come support us over there and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, we're sticking with Juan Mercan because we got to get into this gag order because I don't think the gag order... Uh, prevents Trump from sharing this stuff. The gag order from Judge Juan Mercan has been expanded, but some people say maybe Trump has already violated it. And the question is how? Here is what Drudge posted on his website, and Mediaite was where he linked. But he says the gag order was expanded. Trump violates it? What? And what is this all about? Well, Donald Trump posted this video over on True Social, and you'll see when I took this screenshot, it was the pinned truth. And the question here is because at 423 minutes in, we'll listen to the clip, there is a comment about the judge's daughter, Judge Juan Mercan's daughter. And of course, we ask, what did that order say specifically? Did it say Trump could say stuff about this, that Trump could 
cause other people to say stuff about not to cause other people. And maybe Trump couldn't share other people or spread statements about it. What did it say? Well, we're going to take a look at it, obviously. But after the gag order came out, Trump was well upset, as he should be. He says, you know, I was informed that another corrupt New York judge called Juan Mercan gagged me so that I cannot talk about the corruption and the conflicts taking place in his courtroom with respect to a case that everyone, including the DA, felt should never have been brought. And he's talking about when Kerry Dunn and Mark Pomerantz resigned. Remember, there was a Mark Pomerantz letter that was a former Manhattan DA who we read the letter here. He was very upset. Alvin, I can't believe you're letting this insurrectionist monster or whatever get away with this. And he resigned because Alvin said, we're not bringing the case. And then Matthew Colangelo came down from the, uh, I think from Tish's office. He was formerly at the DOJ, but maybe he was at Tish's office. I think he came over from Tish and then landed with Alvin. And then guess what? They impaneled a grand jury. And then suddenly we saw an indictment come down the pike. So yeah, it was reconstituted again from the Biden administration who sent their third in charge, the acting assistant uh, AG, to come in. So Trump continues. He says, they can talk about me, but I can't talk about them. That sounds fair, doesn't it? This judge should be recused and the case should be thrown out. There has virtually never been a more conflicted judge than this one. Election interference at its worst. And so that's what Trump said. Now, Trump also then posted this, and we're going to take a look at the gag orders. In fact, let's do that now. Remember that the old gag order said this. It said, make Trump is not, okay, he must refrain from doing these things, making or directing others to make public statements, okay, about witnesses or anybody involved. So making or directing others, all right, making or directing others to make public statements about counsel, members of the court staff, DA staff, family members of counsel or staff, if those statements are made, right? So the first one didn't include the judge or the DA's family. And then making or directing others to make public statements about jurors. Okay, so that's the first one. Now, at the ruling in the second one, here's the change. So again, it's amended as indicated below. Making or directing others to make public statements. Right, that's the same. Now, making or directing others to make public statements about counsel, members of the court staff or the DA staff. And here's the change. The members of any council, staff member, family members of any council, staff member, the court or the DA, if those statements are made to interfere or other comments about the jurors. But you'll notice, hmm, something's missing. Doesn't say you can't share statements that other people have said. So maybe Trump can just start re-truthing statements from our show. Mr. President, we're here, standing by, ready to create the perfect clip for you to share with all of America. But of course, the clips that Trump is sharing are talking about Judge Juan Mercan's daughter. And this is the thing that they're saying is maybe violating the order. This is all Trump did. Reposted this on his truth, quoting Jonathan Turley, saying the integrity of the New York legal system is at stake here. That statement here, this message from, from Trump, this truth post, doesn't seem to be illegal at all. He's allowed to talk about the system. He's not talking about the daughter or anybody here. But when you play, let's bring in Fox News contributor. Play George. this clip that has very high volume. We are going to fast forward to about 4:30 because this is where the clip comes in from Mr. Brian Kilmeade, who asks about the order I'll put the on daughter. the former president of the United States in the Alvin Bragg case uh, because they don't want him talking about Prosecutor Matthew Colangelo and they don't want him talking about the judge's daughter. But Matthew Colangelo was in the Justice Department with Joe Biden. That is outrageous to President uh, Trump. Also, the fact is, 
the judge's daughter what is a activist who works for uh, Kamala Harris and there was some some dispute on whether she did have a picture up on a website with jo Donald Trump behind bars that to me is something that you, if I'm Donald Trump I'm a little concerned about that the judge has a daughter who feels this way yeah, I've, I've, I've actually been opposed to gag orders for years, uh, mm. particularly efforts to gag you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> but, that, that's uh, been widespread yeah, and well-known. That's, that's just coming from your, yeah, it's coming from your colleagues, right. which is really not, <laughs> right. uh, the, uh, Well done. But, uh, no, but you're absolutely well right. This is a, a, a really controversial order, and I think it's wrong. You know, you've got Michael Cohen, who is going on the air every night attacking yeah. Trump, or cam basically campaigning against him. He's not allowed to respond. Now, I would prefer that Trump leave these attacks or issues raised with the judge's family to his counsel. I think that's always the better approach. But you we better approach when you're not a presidential candidate, maybe when you are not having to communicate with, you know, half the country, theoretically, the entire country and the world. You want to expose all of this. The attorneys are great, but the attorneys are not Donald Trump. In you know many cases, if you're a defendant, the attorney has more you know exposure and credibility than the defendant does. The attorney can say, "I'm going to call the news media and say, hey, look what they're doing to my client.' Whatever the client's just like, yo, I'm a client. I need some help.' So this is you know this is not the usual case. And obviously, Jonathan Turley is exactly right about this. That Michael Cohen and we played clips of him is over on MSNBC all the time, ranting and raving about Donald Trump and how he's going to get blown out in court. Like they're talking about the case. All, there's evidence, you know, Co Cohen says stuff. I don't want to get into it, but I know there's a lot of evidence and Trump's going down, whatever, you know, stupid shtick. So that apparently is what Trump is allowed to do, right? So he can just share videos that talk about the corrupt judge and the daughter who is working for the Democrats, who post video of Trump in jail and all sorts of things. And I guess that's going to be the new strategy Maybe Judge Juan Mercan will gag Trump a third time. Maybe he'll modify it again to say, hey, now you can't share anything either. We'll see if that happens or not. But let's take a look at some of the filings that led to this gag order. This is the response from Trump, right? So Trump submitted this immediately. It's like the judge didn't even read it. Immediately, the judge just came out and gagged him again. But here's what Trump said, why this lacks merit. He says, you know, Trump has a right to speak. First of all, Trump submits this saying we don't need to clarify anything. Contrary to Alvin Bragg's argument, all right, your gag order, which Trump reserves all rights to appeal, which they're probably going to drop any day now, and then they're going to say they're going to say the appeal is needed because there are external consequences, right? It's not just about the criminal case. Most criminal cases you only appeal at the end because you say if we need to fix anything, we can just go do the trial again ultimately. Right, we'll just go do it again, or we'll preclude it, or we'll see if the mistake was essential to the verdict. Can we save it? You know, if there wasn't, so we leave all the appeals to the end generally. But what happens if you're in, also in the middle of a campaign? So if Trump is gagged, it will cause serious repercussions in the campaign because even though you might be able to do the criminal trial again, you can't do the campaign over again. Like if Trump's gag is invalid and there's no campaign, okay, big deal, you know. Uh, it doesn't impact anything of consequence, right? Now, if he can't talk about the corrupt justice system, you get one campaign, this is it. So they're reserving this right to appeal. They're going to drop it any minute and they got to wait for this judge to deny these motions and then they'll drop it. I think timing is probably perfect. So plainly, it says that the original order does not apply to family members of the court. So we don't need to expand it, although the judge did. Now, the fact that the gag order has been publicly interpreted the way that we read it means it doesn't need clarification. But let's be clear about this. This people, Bragg's abuse of this process, which is trying to restrict Trump's constitutionally protected speech is highlighted by the fact that they failed entirely to address the standard that was proposed and what the standard is for the court staff. Now, they also left all that in place and so they say the court should reject the request to expand this gag order. It's already unlawful. This already improperly restricts campaign advocacy by Trump, the presumptive nominee, the leading candidate in 2024. Now, in support of this motion, Bragg and the Colangelo lawyers, 
they cite two social media posts. That's not enough for them to meet their burden. These two posts alone are not the solidity of evidence that's necessary. And they say Trump's campaign advocacy on issues that bear on his candidacy, as well as the appearance of impropriety associated with these proceedings that warrants recusal, which we got in the other motion, is not a basis for violating the first and the sixth amendments yet again by expanding the gag order. If you expand this gag order, Judge Juan, it's gonna be particularly inappropriate in light of the fact that the court appears to have recently violated a canon of judicial propriety. Judge already violated the rules by making public statements about this case. You use the Office of Court Administration to play PR for your daughter, Judge, which is gonna re require your recusal. Now, under these circumstances, Trump must be permitted to speak on these issues. It's critical. He's a leading presidential candidate and we cannot materially interfere. And none of these statements are intended to materially interfere with these proceedings or cause harm to anyone. And so we should be allowed to talk about it. Now, here's the background on this. Again, this is from Trump's team. These are lawyers writing. This is them acting as officers of the court saying we can, you know, this is, our, this is what we believe happened and we have good faith basis to believe it. They say in March, 2022, more than one year before the indictment and before locking her ex account, Bragg's wife reposted on social media, Alvin, now we're switching gears to Bragg's wife. Bragg's wife, Mrs. Bragg, she's out. She posted, finally, a bit of good news in the Manhattan DA criminal case against Trump. March 22, Alvin got elected before that. So she's talking about her husband, right? Finally, a bit of good news in the Manhattan DA criminal case. It's like, it's your husband, okay? Just say my, my husband. Because the people have Trump nailed on felonies, right? Braggs, who is supposed to be a prosecutor who is not a political hack, who's not a partisan prosecutor. Like, I know that's the norm now because we got Tish James, we got Big Fanny Willis, we got Jack Smith, we got Alvin Bragg, right? I know it's all like, we got partisan prosecutors everywhere we look and all the J6 prosecutors, by the way, the whole DOJ, FBI, I get it, but it's not supposed, that's not how it's supposed to be. So the prosecutor's wife is thrilled to get Trump on felonies. Does she know the inside of the case? Did they invite her to the grand jury proceedings? So before, during, or after that post, your honor's daughter and her company Authentic Campaigns, Lauren's company, profited from offering strategic advice, profiting from preparing text emails and social media posts and other consulting services about campaign advocacy, and they generated funds for Trump's political rivals, including advertisements that specifically referenced and solicited funds based on this case. Daughter got rich. And similarly, before, during, and after the indictment was unsealed from Bragg's office, Bragg watched silently as their star witness, Michael Cohen, assailed Trump, including through political advocacy supportive of Trump's political rivals. Now, at Trump's arraignment on April 4th, the court recognized that prior restraints are extremely problematic. So they're telling Judge Juan, saying, hey, Judge, you know, you said this before, just reminding you. Certainly the court would not impose a gag order at this time, even if it were requested. Such restraints are the most serious and the least intolerable on the First Amendment rights. And that does apply doubly to Mr. Trump because he's a candidate for presidency of the United States. So those First Amendment rights are critically important, obviously. Oh, but the judge didn't know that his daughter was busted at that time. For almost a year until February 22nd, neither the court nor the people raised any concerns about the public statements by Trump as he successfully campaigned for presidency. They were pretty silent, huh? But on February 22nd, without any explanation regarding the timing of the motion, the people, Alvin Bragg, and maybe his wife too, I don't know if she's involved now, to the court to impose a gag order. They asked, can you please gag Trump? And, and they said, it's because trial's right around the corner. We read that filing. Now, the gag order motion 
claimed to seek relief that was identical to what Chutkin has granted. But insofar as Bragg submitted evidence specific to this case, they relied on an affidavit from this guy, Nicholas Pistilli, who focused on events from nearly a year ago in March and April of 2023. Now, this was three, me- three weeks following March 18, 23. Now, this apparently in this affidavit, it was describing threats by third parties, so-called terroristic threats by third parties a year ago. He said that there was a, 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 a volume of unspecified threats that had no connection to this case. So neither Bragg nor the court ever addressed these evidentiary deficiencies. They just imposed the gag, right? Like, okay, why do we need a gag based on this evidence? Okay, what, what is the evidence? Well, it's this guy who's not talking about anything related to this case at all, and it's from a year ago. And the judge is like, oh, perfect, exactly what we need. Thanks, your gag. On March 17th, the AP published an article disclosing that Juan Mercan had participated in an interview with last, uh, last week, with the media last week. Hmm? On March 17th, that's not long ago, this year, your honor, Judge Juan, did an interview. Now, the court appears to have taken this step while Trump's pre-motion letter seeking leave to file for a motion of adjournment, wow, based on pre-trial publicity was pending and the court did not address that request. Whoa! Did not even permit the defense to file the motion until the March 25th hearing. This is wild, okay. So we'll follow a timeline here. Okay, so this is the timeline. Trump files the motion saying, Your Honor, we have pre-trial publicity problems right here. Okay, that was on March 10th. Okay, March 10th, pre-trial publicity. Do not, they're saying, Your Honor, we cannot have a fair trial on March 10th. We need to have a hearing on this, Judge. Can we please file a motion? The judge then gets this motion. It's one page, right? It's the permission slip. The judge then on March 17th, he shows up here for an interview. Judge shows up afterwards, goes and does an interview on the 17th. He's like, pre-trial publicity? Ah, I got an interview scheduled on Wednesday with the AP. So Trump says there's a lot of uh, uh, publicity. The judge goes and increases the publicity. And then on March 25th, the judge says, okay, go ahead now and actually file your substantive pre-trial publicity motion. Isn't that nice? So the judge is going to go be the star of the show first until he actually permits them to file. Isn't that nice? So according to reports of the interview, your honor indicated that the court wouldn't talk about the case, but then you did so anyways, huh? The rules say, quote, a judge shall not make any public comment about a pending or impending proceeding in any court within the United States or its territories, and the judge shall require similar abstention on the part of court personnel subject to the judge's discretion and control. Now, your honor repeatedly stated in this interview that one, quote, getting ready for the historic trial is intense. Eh. And the court is, quote, striving to make sure that I've done everything I could to be prepared and to make sure that we dispense justice. The judge said, there's no agenda here. We want to follow the law. We want justice to be done. That's all we want. Now, as well-intentioned as those remarks may have been, those sentiments should go without saying, okay? That's what we all want is justice. You don't need to say it. The comments appear to be inconsistent with the law, which includes a mandate that was even more important in the context of Trump's then pending and unaddressed request to file to leave, file for permission to submit our motion. You should not have done and given that interview when we said we have a problem with all of the publicity. On March 26, one then adopted the people's proposed gag order in a ruling that made specific reference to Trump's comments about Bragg. The gag order states the following that we've read. Now, two days later then, 
The people submitted this motion in the form of a one-page pre-motion letter. And so then we had to file opposition by 2 p.m. on April 1st. Now, the court should deny the motion, okay? Trump has not violated the gag order. Expanding the gag order would be unconstitutional. It's already unconstitutional. It would be more unconstitutional if you do it. Now, the gag order does not prohibit the public statements that are the basis for the motion. The pertinent provision of the gag order is what we've read. It's unambiguous. It doesn't cover the daughter. Now, consistent with that reality, the people cite some other case. And the opinion notes that your daughter, the opinion indicates the court was aware of prior public statements about your honor's daughter as relevant to the recusal issue. Okay, we've already brought this up, so you know we know about it. And you did not extend the gag order originally, it's a great point, to cover the daughter. So why now? It's because the public's really talking about it, isn't it? It's because Trump's talking about it, isn't it? So if the, if the lawyers talk about the daughter in their recusal motion, not that big of a deal, judge says, well, forget about it, that was a year ago. In the prior recusal motion, now that Trump's talking about it, now that we've got Laura Loomer blasting it out, now that we've got Julie Kelly blasting it out, and everyone else who's working on this amazing issue, you know who you are, they are extending this to cover it, saying no violation has occurred here and there's no violation and so no basis for this contempt warning proposed by Bragg. Now, the motion also overlooks a key feature of the gag, which says it has to be intended to interfere and Trump's social media posts are not doing that, okay? Trump's posts amplified defense arguments about the need for recusal that have already been and will continue to be the subject of our motions, showing the bias and supporting what the defense is already saying. The Post also addressed specific political opponents who are clients of Authentic, where your honor's daughter is a partner and an executive. And they responded to media reports regarding a social media account attributed to your daughter. Now, Trump also noted in one of the posts that those issues are relevant to the election and to our corrupted justice system. Now, such protected political advocacy does not reflect any intent to, quote, materially interfere with the proceedings. And no form of speech, the U.S. Supreme Court said in 1995, is entitled to greater protection than core political speech. Like when you're running a campaign or when you're talking about political partisanship in the justice system. The First Amendment affords us strong protection. And we also have a right as the public, the right to listen to Trump's campaign speech has its fullest and most urgent application when someone is running for office, especially the presidency. And therefore, interpreting this gag order is unconstitutional. So moreover, Trump's comments about your daughter, by the way, the comments about your daughter, Lauren, are as properly understood, are a criticism of the court's prior decision not to recuse itself. They try to distinguish this between criticisms of your honor, so we can criticize the court and your honor, which are fully protected by the First and the Sixth Amendment, they say those aren't covered by the gag order, and references to family members are thus illusory, because one's legitimate. Yeah, well, here here we go. So, they say that the daughter's not covered. You can criticize the court. They say, hold on. One legitimate and constitutionally protected criticism of the court is about the court's failure to recuse themselves or the judge, notwithstanding one member of the court's immediate family member having a financial interest in ongoing attacks against Trump, including in this case by virtue of her senior role at Authentic. And so if you extend the gag order, the gag order would cover the court itself. See how they're doing that? The judge did this, which is why it's such a cowardly thing to do because it's exactly right. The court is covering itself. You can't talk about my daughter because that impugns my legitimacy. It impugns my integrity. We say, yeah, that's true. That's the whole point, which is why you should have recused. 
So it is about the administration of justice, right? It's not people come, you know, it's not fair to attack her daughter. And you had Caitlin Collins on CNN crying about this for like a whole segment with multiple people, you know, oh, my, I'm a judge and my daughter was, a, you know, was threatened and all this crap too. Okay. Was your daughter also a political operative who was running against or, or raising millions of dollars in a trial that you were handling against the political opponent judge? Is it the same thing? So spare me, you're whining, okay? It's not the same thing. This is a political operative, she's like 30-something years old, who is making a lot of money as an operative. So she is absolutely fair game. The judge should have recused himself from this case. He didn't. And so now that is what is being brought to light. But because it's so damaging to their case, now the court is protecting itself, which is, you know, which is pathetic. It's, you know... It's like the judge saying, you can't also criticize me, which would be pathetic, which is basically what he's doing. You know, it's like you should be as the judge in the court, the one who's willing to take slings and arrows. I'm a judge. I can take any insults, right? Criticize me any which way. But he's now saying you can't because his daughter is a partisan operative. Now, the challenge social media posts from Bragg also go at Trump's core First and Sixth Amendment rights. The advocacy was necessary. What Trump said was necessary and appropriate in the current environment. The court has given a public interview, judge did, that included comments about the case during a period where the court failed to address Trump's request for pretrial publicity. Trump says, can we have less uh, publicity, please? The judge says, I'll think about it as soon as I'm done with my interviews. Subsequent to the challenge post by Trump, the court weighed in again by issuing a public statement through the Office of Court Administration, which had now been commandeered to act as a public relations arm of the judge and the family regarding the social media account that had been used by the judge's daughter. Now, in short, a criminal defendant does not, quote, interfere with a criminal prosecution, as that term is used, by exercising their constitutional right. It's not interference to call out government corruption. It's our duty. Now, careful enforcement of the materiality provision is necessary to protect First Amendment freedoms. Now, we talk about mens rea and how these things are interpreted. And so the gag order does not apply to family members at all. And so therefore, Trump did not violate the gag order. And this entire gag order, by the way, is an improper prior restraint. The people bear a heavy burden on this. Recent social media posts are constitutionally protected speech, and they do not constitute two posts a solidity of evidence necessary to strip someone's speech from them. SCOTUS has never allowed the government to prohibit candidates from communicating while with voters during an election. Well, this is a new time, isn't it? Trump has the same rights. The gag order already violates them in a way that implicates federalism concerns. Saying, how can you, how, right? We have, we have a, the federal government has a pretty strong interest in making sure we have a, a coherent federal election that is free and fair. We know what happened last time. They told us it was free and fair. Half the country fell off the map saying, well, we're not so sure about that. We should actually have free and fair elections. Then more, more people would believe in it. But if the feds want a free and fair election, we need to have communication. Otherwise, it is not free and fair, which is why we're all so irritated about what they did in 2020. It wasn't free and fair because we couldn't participate because we were censored in our conversation by the government acting through a third party. So now the question is, can a state violate and usurp a candidate's federal right to speak? Might be a great issue on appeal. Says. The court imposed prior restraint of the gag order is not addressing this other case where Judge Brennan expressed concern that the, the prevention addressing that case. So expanding the gag order would exacerbate these problems. And so another great filing from Todd Blanche, Susan Nicholas, BlancheLaw.com, NicholasLaw.com. Conclusion, they say, for the foregoing reasons, your honor, deny the motion. Now, of course, the judge did not do that. The judge obviously expanded it. 
So we'll fast forward through a lot of this and see what the judge said in his conclusion. He says, you know, one day following the issuance of my order, Trump made several statements attacking a family member of this court. This is Juan Mercan, you know, now fighting for his daughter. Now, contrary to the position that they took in opposition to a prior motion, that his statements are core political speech, this pattern of attacking family members of presiding jurists, me the judge, and attorneys assigned to his case serves no legitimate purpose. You see that? No, 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 no. It's no legitimate purpose for this judge. It's a very legitimate purpose for the rest of us. It's clearly legitimate because it implicates the judge. We, we have questions about his rulings now, about the legitimacy, the appearance of impropriety, if not the actual conflict that exists here. The judge has commandeered using court institutions to now act as PR entities. The judge is now giving interviews, right? The judge is clearly a conflicted person and he has apparently talked to his daughter, according to her podcast, about Trump treat tweets when he was the president in 2019, talking about how those tweets were aggravating to him. Okay, so he should be gone off the case, but no legitimate purpose because it undermines their credibility. Now, it merely injects fear in those assigned or called to participate. Are you scared, Judge Juan? Are you scared because we're talking about your daughter's authentic fundraising for Democrats? That they, not only they, but their family members as well are fair game for Trump's vitriol. She is a political consultant who is in the arena of politics oppositional to Trump. So here's the judge. Now, court, now that, that's the ultimate crux of the holding, okay? Such a cowardly thing to do to insulate yourself from any criticism by using your daughter as insulation is just as about as low as it gets. Courts are understand. He's like, you, he's like a, she's like a shield. He's like, here, honey, like here, lay in front of me. And now, he, now don't talk about the family to shield the court from the court's recu failure to recuse itself, right? Should have been an honorable man with integrity and just said, yeah, we're a little bit conflicted here. I'm not the right judge for this case. Obviously didn't want to do that. This is, the, this is a historic case. This is a case of a century. He's preparing for this to make sure he can dispense justice according to his own words in his own interview. So he, he's going to give us the lecture, okay? Courts are understandably concerned about First Amendment rights, especially when he's a public figure. But the instant matter is different, okay? The conventional David versus Goliath roles are no longer in play because Trump's words have power on countless others. And the threats, here you go, to the integrity of the judicial proceeding, okay? It's the same a synonym for a integrity of democracy, attacks on democracy, no longer limited to the swaying of minds because the people say multiple witnesses have already expressed concern. So this judge is... This case is such a rigged sham, I can't even take it. But it, listen to just how this judge writes. Alvin Bragg said multiple witnesses have already expressed their concerns about their safety. And so it's no longer a mere possibility. The threat is very real. Admonitions are not enough, nor is reliance on restraint. The average observer must now, after hearing Trump's recent attacks, draw the conclusion that if they become involved in these proceedings, they should worry for not only themselves, but for their loved ones as well. Well, I, I mean, if their loved ones are involved in the attack, then yeah, they're fair game. They get to be involved in it. That's, that's, the, that's the cost of playing the game. Trump is not attacking some eight-year-old girl who's reading romance novels somewhere, okay? This woman is a major player raising $100 million for the Democrats, so this is all just, you know, a red herring. It's a shiny object. Our loved ones are under attack. No. Political operatives who are fair game for criticism are being criticized. And as well is the judge's decision himself. So the judge, you know, continue. Such concerns will undoubtedly interfere with the fair administration of justice and constitutes a direct attack on the rule of law itself. If you criticize the court, it's an attack on the rule of law. See how that goes?
That is not America at all. This is the same, you know, democratic garbage. Garbage. This is tyrannical judiciary inaction. Again, all citizens called to participate in these proceedings must now concern themselves with not only their personal safety, but also attacks on their loved ones. That reality cannot be overstated. And Trump desperately attempts to justify and explain his dangerous rhetoric. This is the judge who's going to be presiding over this case. And he's blaming those attacks. Now, the arguments that counsel makes are strained and at worst baseless misrepresentations, right? They're uncorroborated. They rely on innuendo and exaggeration. Now, the assortment, this is where the judge is attacking, I, I, I guess, addressing his daughter, Put mildly, the assortment of allegations that are presentment as, presented as facts and cobbled together, they result in accusations that are disingenuous and not rational. The judge just decided it's not rational to attack his daughter, who everyone admits has a problematic ex account and works for Kamala Harris and Adam Schiff. To argue... The argue to argue that the most recent attacks, which included photographs, were necessary and appropriate in the current environment is farcical to this judge who says his daughter is totally innocent, you know, and then he's a man of integrity. He is deluded that he thinks that the people argue in their submission that Trump's attacks, which he says, which are his free speech, which include referring to a prosecution last week as death are based on transparent falsehoods. Bragg provides a plethora of, of compelling arguments saying that Trump is intending to intimidate this court and to impede the orderly administration of this trial. That is the same garbage, remember, that Fannie Willis came out with when motions were filed and she even said that Jocelyn Wade's case may be interfering with her administration of justice, okay? If you come at these people, if you say you're a partisan hack, you are biased clearly, and we can't trust your judgment at all, get some integrity, please, and come back. And you have evidence to support that. That, you know, that is part of justice, by the way. Okay, In order to have orderly administration of a trial or justice, you, it, there is no order if you can't trust the judge. So you got to get that settled clear before anything else can happen. Otherwise, there is no court of law. And, and this judge has now, right, he's going to fail to recuse himself again. But his daughter, he's going to just write off as saying this is farcical. Like, this is embarrassing for this judge. It's innuendo and it's exaggeration. Can you explain that for us? Can you give us another paragraph to say, no, she doesn't actually work at Authentic? No, she hasn't worked for Kamala we never talk about this. You can give us the Joe Biden excuse. I never talked to my daughter about her business. Okay. Whatever. Nothing. It's an exaggeration. It's not facts. It's cobbled together. Then he doesn't address it at all. Thanks. Now the people in their submission wanted some other things. And he says, your motion is now granted. If Trump violates this, they're going to strip Trump of more rights. So he's already being stripped of his free speech rights. They'll now also strip him of his right to access the juror names so that they can put rigged jurors on there, right? So you can have a bunch of like, you know, Molly Jongfast and George Conway, you know, cousins or their love childs all out there on the jurors, on the jury panel. And Trump will never know who they are. No, never know that they write for the Washington Post because you can't research them. So they'll strip another fundamental right away from him, the right to a fair trial by having knowledge about who is judging you. Now, it remains this court's fundamental responsibility to protect the integrity of the process, right? What integrity, judge? Consistent with this decision, therefore, they are now granting Bragg's motion. And the main change here was that you cannot talk about family members of the court, the judge, his daughter, Lauren Mercan, who is clearly a Democrat operative. And so, we got more on this. Now, this is a great article. I just wanted to flag for you. We'll just mention it briefly here. But the, the fact is, there is a lot of smoke and fire behind the smoke. We have Lauren Mercan's firm. This is from Julie Kelly. A great piece over at declassified.live says the ties 
between Murkan's child, okay, her, the, the judge's child, he's so young and innocent, stop attacking his daughter, represents a major conflict in the hush money trial, okay? Lauren's firm was paid $4 million by Adam Schiff at the same time that Shifty was conspiring with Cohen to take down Trump. Cohen is going to be the star witness in this entire case, right? Now, you'll notice here some pretty big numbers, and I'm subscribed over to Julie Kelly, as you'll see here, but she writes at Declassified.Live, the same month that Schiff and Schiff's campaign paid a new Chicago-based consulting firm 600 k for digital media, the firm Authentic Campaigns was the people who got paid for that. It was headed by Lauren Mercon, 34-year-old daughter of the New York judge, now overseeing the so-called hush money case against Trump. Shifty Schiff, let's see where some of these numbers are. Shifty Schiff was prosecuting him. Man, this is some great research here. And so, okay, here you go. According to a new analysis, Schiff's Senate campaign committee, he is running to replace the late Dan Dianne Feinstein. Look at this number. Shifty has paid authentic campaigns more than $10 million. That's according to the Post. They also reported that Schiff cited the Bragg indictment in emails while looking for campaign donations. So you see the big incestuous circle that is happening here. And a great report from Julie Kelly. Make sure you're following her on X at Julie underscore Kelly too, covering the very censured Adam Schiff. And of course, we got George Conway, who also can't get enough of Trump. And he was brought on as the so-called conservative lawyer for MSNBC. You see that there on the Chiron. And this is where he's talking about Trump being a psychopath. And I just want to play this so you can see kind of what a psychopath looks like when they're ranting about other people, because that's what George Conway sounds like here. It's just a bunch of name calling and then referencing the partisan prosecutions against his political opponent. He doesn't even sound very well here. What is your take? Is this expanded order even enough to deal with that threat? It may not be because Donald Trump is a sociopath. He's a psychopath. Nothing will stop him from trying to do what he wants to do, which is to intimidate and roll over and, and attack anybody he feels is a threat to him. And he is feeling that threat more than ever from all different fronts. And it's quite possible this may not be enough. I mean, he is a very, very destructive individual. He is mentally ill. He is very self-destructive in particular, as we saw with the E. Jean Carroll trial, where he basically, he acted out in front of the jury and, and basically bought himself the, the punitive damages award that he had to post his $88 million, $80, $83 million bond for. This is, this- That was the case that George Conway was obviously involved in, right? George Conway, in my opinion, took advantage of a mentally deranged woman called E. Jean Carroll and then introduced her to Roberta Kaplan that launched the lawsuit after they changed the law to enable them to prosecute Trump in the first place. Man isn't well, and he's going to continue to behave in an irrational fashion and in a bullying fashion and in a threatening fashion because that is that's just the way he's built. And it's, it's not, you know, it's weird, you know, to have uh, these exchanges. It's like, is that all he does is just go, like, he's supposed to be a conservative lawyer offering, I guess, legal analysis. But every time we play a clip from him, he's always just ranting. Trump's a psychopath, sociopath, demented, maniac, wants to bully everybody. It's like, are you going to give us some legal analysis at all? You're just going to call him a bully like every time you talk? At all? Like, do you have a new point, a talking point at all? So apparently the gag order not preventing Trump, okay, from sharing st statements about Lauren Mercon, the DNC Democrat operative who is raising a ton of money for Democrats and working directly against Trump and Trump's interests. Now sharing stuff about that on True Social, judge expanding the gag. We know that Donald Trump is saying that this is already unconstitutional and that they're reserving all of their appellate rights. So appeal likely coming down the pike any day now. And we're going to be here continuing to cover it, my friends. And so I hope you join us as we do. Thank you so much for subscribing and for liking this video and for inviting someone you know or love to come and join us when we go live, sharing a video, sharing a short form piece of content with them. 
so they get a little taste of what happens here because there's a lot that they're not seeing unless they're here joining us unpacking it all. And so we'd also like to invite you to check out some of our links down in the description below. Watchingthewatchers.locals.com is our members only community and a great way you can support the show, get some extra content about other topics that we can't get into here and meet some amazing people while you do it. We'd love to see you there. Watchingthewatchers.locals.com and back here on the next one. All right, my friends. And now we got one final segment on the day. And we got some testimony to listen to, but this is very curious. No signatures in Fulton County, Georgia. That's according to testimony from Mark Wingate during the disbarment proceedings involving Jeffrey Clark that were taking place earlier. And we're gonna go through some of what Mr. Wingate had to say, because apparently he was on a board, was sending a bunch of emails and notices, trying to get evidence about what was being conducted by the Board of Elections where he was serving. And he was told they didn't do any signature verification. In fact, the signature verification mechanism itself was not functional. Who is this guy? Mark Weingart, Wine Wingate, you see here, is the person who was testifying during the Jeffrey Clark disbarment proceedings and I found some documents and some email exchanges between him and some other people that we need to know a little bit about before we get into the proceeding itself. This is what we see from the Board of Elections. Now, I have served on a board very much like this, and this feels familiar to me, but I wanted to share how this works, essentially. You're going to see this guy who's testifying is Mr. Mark Wingate, Republican Party appointee, nominated by the full board, his term ends 6-30-2021. Now he's part of a panel of five total people, okay? Four other people here on the board with him. They make up a forum and they vote on certain issues, right? So he is there. Now he's a Republican appointee, you see. You have a Democrat party appointee, a Democrat party appointee, another Republican, so two Dems, two Republicans and a chairman. So he's involved back during 2020. And you see the person who is really, really running this. And the way that this works is you have these like permanent government liaisons, this guy, Richard L. Barron, his name's going to come up here in a minute. He's the director of registration and elections, which is this entity that meets. His email is here. And there's these other people, the, these chairs of the Republican party, chair of the Democrat party, Kelly, and Pines. So that's what this guy was involved in. And he was in office back during the 2020 election. And this is an election board that merges the functions of registration and elections, and it does a bunch of stuff. So he's on the board. Now, that is some foundation. What is he involved in? This is some of the emails that I was able to capture just from one simple exchange. And so let me share with you what's going on here. Now, this is an email on Sunday, November 29, 2020. It's from Richard Barron. Remember him? He was the director of the election and registration board. He wrote right after the election, November 29th, this is a copy from an email that we're going to see Mr. Wingate is responding to. Richard wrote, we still don't know if Dominion can retrieve the files on the failed server. Huh? The tech that's been with us through the recount was unable to fix it because it's outside his area of expertise. Hmm. Dominion is sending someone in the morning to work on it. If the new tech can't fix the server, then we'll have to rescan early voting absentee and provisional ballots. All right, so this is just one evidence of kind of what this guy, Mark Wingate, was talking about. So this is an email from the executive, you know, the director of the registration and election board. It goes out to the team. So we got Wingate responds. He, this is him responding 5, 11 p.m. 10 minutes later, he says, good Lord. So operations are ceased for now? He responds, sends that one back to Richard Barron. Barron responds, he says, well, we were scheduled, only scheduled eight to five today, 
and we have until midnight on Wednesday to complete this. So, you know, if you buy a computer at a store and it fails, you get a refund or a new one or they fix it. That is what we're dealing with. He says, people are freaking about this. People that are freaking about this are so off the rails. I'm ignoring the noise. Computers fail. We can start over. It's not ideal, but it's the reality that we face. Wasn't this supposed to be like a perfect election where everything was perfect? Hmm. So then Barron got a message. So Mark Wingate responded. He said, well, like, what, what, I think I didn't clip it, but he says something like, who's making a ruckus out there? What, who's making a noise, the noise? Richard, the head of elections, says, I heard that David Schaefer is tweeting up a storm. External Affairs is fielding lots of calls because of all of his tweets. David Schaefer? Who's that? Oh, yeah. The guy they charged with a crime in Fanny's case. Remember him? David Schaefer is tweeting up a storm. He got charged with a crime. He's saying there's a bunch of problems with our election. So then Mark Wingate comes out, says, I will get a message out. Okay, so, you know, hey, we're working on this. We're going to read constitute the drives, whatever. Mark Wingate on the elections board says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get a message out. We continue and Richard responds back to Mark. He says, I'd appreciate it. Thanks for getting the message out. I alerted the state earlier today to when it happened, when the, you know, when the computer broke. Mark sends a message the next morning, right? Bright and early. So 631, November 30th, after November 29th, 909, Mark Wingate sends a message back over to Richard. He says, hey, Richard, good morning. Kindly let us know where you are at on the server and data issue. So we are not behind the eight ball. Now, I, you know, I, you talk about like servers, doing things again, rescanning stuff, reconstituting stuff. Let me fix this. Let me have another technician doing this. Okay, that is all outside of the norm, right? You have pr protocols that you follow so that you don't taint anything, right? Like in a DUI case, you have very specific procedures that you follow. And if the machine has an error for whatever reason, you have to stop everything, okay? And you have to pull that machine out of service, do a root cause analysis to what happened with that machine, before you can ever put it back into service. And it's like a huge nightmare, which is why crime labs hate doing it and they flub everything. But the point is, okay, when there is a major problem, it, it causes concern because if the machine has a problem, if the chain of custody is invalid, if there's some problem with the mechanics, it could jeopardize the entire sample, right? It's like, you know, you, you don't break the seal until it gets to your house, then you break the seal. But if somebody else, if your, if your delivery driver breaks the seal and then seals it back up and gives it to you, you don't eat that anymore. So if we already have mechanisms that were already in place and now we have backup servers and dudes from California flying out and having to do it all over again, all, that introduces possibility for error or manipulation or for rigging, obviously. So here is what Mark says back. He says, okay, good morning. Kindly let us know where you're at on the server data issue so we're not behind the eight ball. Here's a question I have. Why did we operate in this single point of failure environment and not have a ready backup server? Good question, Mark. I'm not taking a shot, rather trying to get ahead of a logical question. Response from Richard says from his iPhone, we have another server, the project package files crashed with the server. We never had a second server as a backup until now. We bought this for LNA, probably logic and accuracy, and it can be used for the recount. It gives us the ability to operate remotely. Hmm. It saves us multiple trips per day to the warehouse from the GWCC. The computer was four days old and it broke. A technician is flying from California. Maybe it was Hunter Biden's, uh, you know, bro. He arrives at five. We're going to forward from scratch, operating as though he won't be able to fix it. Won't be able to fix it. Interesting, right? Perfect election. That was, uh, no one had any reason to investigate. And if you tweeted about it, like David Schaefer did, you got prosecuted. So here it continues. Mark says, Rick, he, he messages Rick. Rick, 
please have Jessica get an email out ASAP before the media starts their own stories. Rick says she issued a statement last night that she sent to everyone. And of course, that's just a, a snapshot of some of the emails, okay? So that's the guy, his name's Mark Wingate, and he was testifying, explaining there are a lot of problems with the election that there were that were in that was taking place there in Georgia. And this was clipped by Kanakoa the Great. I know many other people have done some good work on this, including Molly Hemingway and others that were investigating all the problems in Georgia. But here is just a bit of testimony. We'll play through it and I'll try to let it go with minimal reaction and interruption. Uh, to have concern about everything was much, much earlier in 2020. Uh, and I can't remember exactly when I began. I was started looking at our voter rolls and, you know, I did, you know, some fairly simplistic um, research on the population of Fulton County, Georgia. And what I found out, and of course started pressing that with the elections department, uh, you know, through subsequent uh, 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 monthly meetings, et cetera, was that the numbers that I was able to ascertain, we had more voters on the active voter rolls than we did of the population of the entirety of Fulton County huh? and then extrapolating for those of voting age. More voters. So that became a major concern of mine and frankly, uh, you know, lasted throughout and, and continued even after more voter registrations uh, the and voters. 2020 election. Okay. Um, so that was a big issue. And of course, inside that 2020 time frame, uh, really there was nothing done to uh, wasn't time, and I understand all of that, but you know, th there was nothing done to answer my questions on that. And uh, that I thought, well, look, you know, it, it's only fair to the voters of Fulby County that, you know, we're having clean voter rolls here so that nobody's vote, uh, you know, is disparaged because, uh, you know, somebody may have come in and voted that frankly, you know, legally should not be able to. Weird. I think that's very, very important for the be full encounter anywhere in the country. And but we should investigate that. From that. Um, Which was Trump is exactly what Trump was doing. In the 2020 election itself, uh, I had and other board members uh, had requested that we uh, obtain the chain of custody documentation from the department. And none of that was ever delivered. Uh, it was not delivered uh, at re at the time of request leading up to the election and was certainly not given. Uh, we weren't giving in. I, I, I was given nothing, uh, you know, even uh, leading up to this. Let me interrupt you right there, uh, Mr. Wingate, and mm -hmm. ask to explain for the committee what you mean by chain of custody documents. Okay. Uh, uh, in, in, important in, stuff the the election staff you know they, we had many components in many areas where that were um, absentee by mail ballots were being uh, delivered to and then uh, picked up and then centralized to a, you know the processing uh, uh, center and then of course you know there's documentation so that whoever is handing those envelopes in that case off to then it's there to sign off that they've delivered to this person and, you know, the, the, the transportation or transport of those documents, you know, which was going on, which goes on daily, uh, uh, you know, in case you're not familiar uh, in, in the election cycle. Uh, and then once they are delivered to the location that they're destined to, there is another uh, signature required on a document that shows that, it, you know, where it was picked up driven to delivered to and then signed off on as received and it's a physical and document th this you is going on it. from multiple locations daily and uh you know in terms of the um memory cards that are being delivered so that they can be kept you know in security uh there's the same level chain of command docu uh, chain of custody documentation that is delivered for all of the memory cards coming in from early voting locations, and of course on election day uh, from each of the each A of the gave precincts. it to B, B gave right. it to C, C uh, gave it that, to D. That's and fundamentally so on. what that what that in, encompasses. Just all like right, that's evidence. Great. Thank you very much. I interrupted you to get that, so uh, pick back up where you were talking about uh, asking for and not receiving 
chain of custody documents. Very basic okay, paper. Well, that, you know, since we, we asked and did not receive any of it, you know, that to me is just one reason. Well, how can I trust? You can't. You know, as a board member to certify this election when I cannot receive even a sampling, anything at all, with regards to chain of custody, uh, chain of custody documents. You can't think about a DUI case. Okay, if they pull you over and draw your blood, they track that those two vials everywhere they go. Okay, officer so and so withdrew it. They gave it to some other officer who impounded it. It goes into evidence. Boom! It's all logged. Date, time, logged. Person comes out to do the sample analysis. The crime lab techs, they come, they pull it out of evidence, they mark it down, it's all logged, right? If you end up in a, in a DUI case and they say, hey, we got your DUI result, it's a 0.25, you go, what? Where'd that blood sample come from? They say, well, does, you don't, it doesn't matter, here it is, you, this is your result. You say, well, I wanna know how you tested it, where'd it come from? Uh, well, you don't, this person tested it, this person tested it, here, here's the person, uh, you know, uh, John Doe tested it, here you go, here's your result. What? I don't care who tested it. Where did he get the sample that he tested from? And the person who put it into evidence, what did they do with it before they put it into evidence? Did they rewrite the vial on someone else's blood or whatever? Like I need to know from the moment it left my body to the moment it entered the crime labs, you know, analysis, what, who possessed it and where did it go? And if you don't have that, right, that blood sample is invalid. The courts will say that. They'll say, no, I don't know. You know, if, if the, like say, let's say the officer who withdrew the blood, right, is, is no longer with us or retires. Or I had a case where I got a blood sample dismissed where the officer who transported the blood had retired essentially, okay? Was no longer around, left the state of Arizona. Nobody knows where this guy was. So phlebotomy, the blood draw was happening on the side of the road. They gave it to this other cop. He drove it to the uh, evidence lab, impounded it. That guy was gone. So my argument was, I don't know what he did to the sample when he was driving around in his car and nobody can ask him about this. So he's gone. Blood sample was invalid, has to go because it's a broken chain of custody. It's very, very important. And they're not even giving them to the election board. That is a problem. In my opinion, that should invalidate whatever number they show you to your face because you can't backtrace it to where it came from. Just like in criminal law, it's not even complicated. And elections should be held to a much higher standard than currently, which is rigged. They should not be rigged. They should be held to, I would say, beyond a reasonable doubt. Shouldn't we have faith in our elections beyond a reasonable doubt? So that was just uh, another one of the things in my mind leading up to certification that was uh, something that you, you know certainly was not fulfilled. Um, there was also at that for that election uh, the advent of this whole uh, Dropbox uh, uh, circumstance was uh, was you know was um, uh, unveiled and then we had I I think Fulton County we had like thirty six or so drop boxes located around the county and these drop boxes at, at that particular point were set outside of uh, of an early voting location which means that uh you know they're in the you know they're in the elements they're you know they're 24 hours a day but there were surveillance cameras as required that uh supposedly you know, were operating 24 seven so that uh, they could be monitored and anybody tried to do any damage or anything nefarious to any of those locations that that could be looked at. And, you know, hopefully somebody uh, sent out there to, uh, to to secure the situation. But we'd ask for um, uh, not every surveillance tape, but ask for to see surveillance tapes uh, uh, on a uh, basically, you, you know, whatever just give us some samplings of no that tanks. so we can take a look at it because uh it, we knew i knew that this was going to be an important issue because of all the hullabaloo that any of us that were alive in those days you know was witnessing as being an issue and uh from that request uh again to uh, just you know 
the way in which it turned out, there was never one surveillance tape, uh, an inch of footage that was ever delivered to the board. Why not? And if it was delivered to anybody, it certainly was not any board member that I was aware of or made me aware of. Why do you so why, that what are you even doing a, on the board? Yeah, uh, what was another issue? Just a placeholder. The other issue we had down here was was this whole um, questioning of uh, ballots underneath a table and then being pulled out on election night. <clears throat> excuse me, at State Farm Arena. Well, you know where the water we main did break see happened. on television. By the way, we did see that surveillance tape, and of course. I, I, as a board member and knowing uh, uh, most all of those people who were in that room that night, um, it, 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 I, I didn't make any judgment as to what was going on. It wasn't I had I had no basis to do that, um, but I did see it. And of course, I asked the questions of our director and um, this was, I believe, the day following Election Day. And, uh, you know, his response was, well, he just hasn't had time to look into this. Yeah, but he not. will and get back to us. Of course. Well, there was nothing ever gotten back to, at least to me as a board member. Just to lay that it had long any enough. explanation of um, that election night at State Farm Arena. And uh, we got to certification and there was still no response to that. Did not know, still being investigated exactly. Well, I think the director, in my opinion, and still believe that to this day, could have you know, stated, look, I've talked to everybody and this is what transpired. I, I firmly believe that should have been done by the then director, uh, but it was not. And the last thing was, um, well, not the last thing, but the, the the big, what I call the four or five things that, that prevented me from certifying was the, we had such a huge, huge number of absentee by mail ballots. And those ballots, um, we, we as the, as the department and the board and Here then the uh, board of commissioners who has to approve, you know, certain expenditures, um, because it was you know becoming very very clear that there was going to be a larger amount of absentee by mail ballots this, this election year than by far than in previous years so they uh, found a term in a system that um, is called blue crest okay and the blue crest platform primarily was an absentee by mail or a paper ballot uh uh uh, uh processing uh um application and so that would software you know, scan for in the outer oath envelopes it would open them it would then pull them out it would flatten them as they call it and then put them in bundles for <clears throat> excuse me for later processing and scanning uh, part of that or one of the applications or elements of that blue crest platform uh, was a uh, an electronic signature verification component Important. And of course, we all, as that was reported, we all thought that that was going to be up and running and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how exactly that the department and the people uh, uh, there for managing the absentee by mail ballot processing would have a very fine function in the electronic signature verification component. Well, as I recall, I believe that time frame was in October at, at the board meeting for October, right before the election, uh, I had asked the question, where are we with regards to the functionality of the uh, electronic signature verification component? And I was told that uh, the um, technicians from Bluecrest were in our building that day working hard and that they were working to functionalize the um, the electronic signature verification component. Well, well, functionality and functionalize uh what's the plain english meaning of that in october meaning getting it to work in october thank you if All that right. makes sense yeah i'm sorry I right now All right. like in the they building. were in there to make the thing work okay and you know we certainly you know as we would let you know the board meeting concluded we went on but um after the fact we we've we were not hold in between that October date. And then of course, about a month later, the election itself, you know, 
at least I was not told that they didn't that they did not get it to work. Uh, so you know, somewhere along the line, and I can't. I am sorry, I can't remember exactly when it was, but I had asked the question. Well, okay, well, you know, what did we do for signature verification? And the comment I got back was, which frankly at that time floored me, was, well, you know, we didn't do any. Mm. And I remember kind of, I forget yeah. where I was, you know, I was somewhere on a phone call, I forget exactly, and I apologize, it's been so long. Yeah, but, didn't do it. you know, I do remember that comment that, you know, we didn't do any. Now, Clearly. of course, I took that saying, all right, well, by law, you know, you you've got to do signature verification. You've got you've got to at least have somebody looking at this, and one side of that is uh, that the whomever you have that is looking at and supposed to be you know verifying signature that if there is no signature on the oath envelope, then how are you curing it or what are you doing with them? And they I I remember going down the, you know on, on from want. that and said well you know. There weren't many, so we just sent them back out. And if they reply on time, then they'll get their vote counted. And I thought that was a little weak. But anyway, that's what that's as I recall, that's what I was told. Wild. So All they right, rejected right. some of the signatures. There's some of them, not many of them. But like if it's like clearly somebody looked at them and we just sent them back out. And if they cured it, then, you know, it's a couple hundred people, not a big deal, whatever. So it's just lowest common denominator bureaucracy garbage, right? It's either intentionally opening up a door so that there can be rigging or it's allowing the incompetence to just enable it in uh, and of itself, right? It's so incompetent that you don't even need to do anything very complicated. You try to get, you know, the vote margin in Georgia was like 11,000, 12,000 votes, very small. And if there's no signatures being checked and they have computer servers failing and there's no real accountability to chain of custody about where the votes are coming from or how they're getting tallied, it is total insanity. And this mirrors, by the way, all of the opinions that we saw from the Obama appointed judge, who I believe was Totenberg who made the same argument that the, the elections in Georgia are so problematic. It's almost like a joke. It's almost like just, you know, good enough. They, well, it's good enough. We looked at some things and it's good enough for everybody. And they just pass it on. It's like just passing kids up the grades. Those, those are primarily, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was primarily the, in my mind and in my reasoning, why I was not comfortable, you know, in, in certifying. All right, sir. And what was the vote on certification? What was the vote total on certification when the board voted? Well, there were uh, there were two uh, uh, in the board. You know, there's two Republicans, two Democrats, and then supposedly, which doesn't always work that way, an independent or a nonpartisan chair. Uh, the vote was two, three uh, to certify and two against. And that was for both certification votes. No, uh, that's yes, yes, yeah. All right, and do you have an understanding of how much uh, the Blue Crest system cost the county to do the signature verification to open up all mm, the things? Yeah, I know, I, and again, I, I can't be precise, but it seems to me like the entire platform was a little over a million bucks. Nice, doesn't work at all. Dollars. Great. <laughs> and I'm it, sorry, I'm trying to clear my throat. To your knowledge, did they ever get it working? To my knowledge, no. Uh, it did. It obviously did not work uh, leading up to and going through any of the 2020 elections. And I, it was not. I don't believe uh, that if I don't believe it was working either. You know, for the um, runoffs that we had Incredible. coming out of 2020 elections. Did they get it working in a later election while you were on the board? Uh, to my knowledge, no. <clears throat> Do you we, have? A we had asked, I'm sorry. We had asked a couple of times and had gotten a response that no, but there was no pressure on them after the 2020 election and runoffs to do that.
Do you recall approximately how many absentee ballots were counted in Fulton County in the November 2020 presidential election? Yeah, it was, uh, I think, a few more than 147,000. 147,000, not signature checked ballots. Boom. Wow. Okay, so it is just shocking to hear the level of incompetence, if not just outright corruption. Everybody just passes the buck. That's close enough. We did some signature ballots. Chain of custody. We'll get those documents to you. Everybody just keeps kicking the can down the road. You just have to wait long enough until January 6 happens and then everything kind of gets deviated from there. All of the election trials, all of the election challenges evaporated overnight. After January 6, everybody moved on. You couldn't even talk about the election anymore, right? It was all insurrection fever. And so they just had to get it right past the finish line. They shoved Joe Biden in the White House and then who cares what happens, right? Who cares? They start prosecuting Trump and the steal has been completed. But really shocking to hear it from Mark Wingate. And I know there's a lot of digging that's been done on this. So this is just scratching the surface. Molly Hemingway wrote a whole book about it. And so we're going to be here continuing to cover it. But the fact that they don't even have chain of custody provisions, documents that were provided back over to the election board members, the fact that they are telling them that, yeah, there's guys in the building who are trying to get the, the signature verifications working in October. And then they tell them that it wasn't really working in November, right? It, it matches everything that we've already seen here. Judge Amy Totenberg from Georgia has said the same thing and there's litigation going on, but they told us, they lied to us that this was a safe, secure election. It was free and fair, most secure in nation's history and all this stuff because their bureaucrats were busy covering it up. And now the truth is coming out. We're gonna be here continuing to cover it, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for liking this video, inviting a friend or family member to come over here and join us so they don't miss out on what they're doing behind the scenes in our government. We got some great links down in the description. Would love to see you over on our Locals community, watching the watchers.locals.com. We do streams in the morning. We talk about other stuff that we don't have the time to get into here and a lot of fun stuff like gardening, which is what we talked about today. Good stuff. And I'm going to get one of those vertical gardens. Thanks to Locals. So come join us watching the watchers.locals.com. We'll see you over there and right back here on the next one. All right, my friends. That is it for us on the day. Woo, we covered some good ground. We got no signature verification in Georgia. Juan Mercan's gag order doesn't include tr preclude Trump from sharing other people's statements. And we read through the gag order there. And of course, now Trump is moving to recuse Judge Juan Mercan and has asked for permission to file the mega brief. We'll see if the judge grants it. But now, my friends, it is time to hear from you. And then, of course, we are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. If you're a member, you also join us for our debriefs. But let's see who is here on the day. And I'm very grateful for your donos and your amazing and incredible support. And what's up? We got John McGarvey Donuts here clipping for us. What's up? Lawrence F. is our newest supporter. Welcome aboard, Lawrence. Great to have you as a new member on the YouTubes. 66 Anton is here. Says, it's always awesome, Rob, when you put the show notes up and I get excited about how great the show's going to be. Let's go! I, I kind of get excited too when I'm getting the show prepped up. I type those notes up and I'm like, you know, I try, I want them to be a little spicy and a little bit teasy, you know, so it kind of, that's good. It's working. The whole system's working. Thanks. Thanks, Anton. Thanks for being a locals member. Great to have you. Thanks for supporting us. Hey, this one from Amanda Del Rey says, hello there. I just joined last night after the show had already ended. I'm trying out locals versus YouTube. I don't know much about locals and want to learn. Well, welcome Amada Del Rey. And man, thank you, Amada, for dropping in a message in the chat. Locals chat's pretty busy. You know, we got a lot of uh, amazing people there saying amazing things. So sometimes it can be a little bit hard to jump in there. And Amada just joined. Locals is amazing. Uh, YouTube is great. Of course, we love our YouTube members as well. Locals, we have a little bit more. You have a little bit more there because you can post your own stories. You can comment on other people's stories. We do the after party over there. And 
there's just more there, right? You know, there's more you can do there. So come and uh, we're glad you joined us, Amada. Great to see you. Hey, Jen, Jen Italis. Jen Italis is our newest supporter. Welcome aboard, Jen Italis on YouTube. Dolphin fan is the man in the house bringing in five new membos, including Spitfire, Ray H, opposing forces here. The Sentinels coming in and Dan D, welcome aboard. Hey, more from Dolphin bringing in Derek Z, Margaret M, Stephen C, Aubin A, Antiplode is here, and Johnny Boy, all gifted members, courtesy of Dolphin Fan, is the man in the house. Hey, what's up, Sandy over on Local says, this talk of Trump going into custody is stupid. Secret Service as law enforcement has authority over Trump. They are prohibited from acquiescing their control over to another agency. They would, in fact, arrest anyone putting their hands on Trump. The better dig for people is Walt Nada. Teasing you, Rob. Hint. Walt was still an employee of the Navy when he worked in Mar-a-Lago for Trump. How many presidents get Navy protection? Yeah, I don't think that. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I agree. I think if they put Trump in custody, that would be a big problem for them. And we kind of, you know, mocked that lady yesterday who was saying that she thought it would be appropriate to do that. You know, enough already. Just put him in jail. It's like, okay, try it. If you think it's so simple, just try it. See what happens. Right. Actual judges know better. So it would cause a major ruckus. And I don't think it would be smart for them to do that. Maybe they'll maybe they'll try. We'll see. Good to see you, Sandy. This one, shout out to Laura Loomer. She's doing a great job. If you're not following her, you should be. Says even, yeah, Lauren Mercon was, worked for Revolution Messaging. She coordinated Trump Wars, a resistance campaign. She coordinated phone calls. She worked for a, apparently it was anti-Trump working for Bernie Sanders in 2016, right? The depth is deep, man. It's deep. Hey, hey, it's the Munkets. Tony Hey Munkets is bringing in 10 Membos. Betty Cracker, Bruce Wayne, Batman's here. Big Boy Blue, Thad the Man, CA Human, Nurple's here. Digital Soldier, Zancy Pelosi, Merms, and Stop Sniffing Kids Joe. Did you notice Joe Biden wasn't very active today because he was sniffing kids all day yesterday during the Easter ceremony? Hey, this is from Glock. He says, a tad bit off topic, but it's a, the election season. And Trump is up against the wall this election. And wokeness sent this out. I'm just curious why, why Republican states allow this. Yeah, I saw this. Hey, look at these numbers. Numbers of voters registry, registering to vote without photo ID is skyrocketing. Since the start of 2024, 200,000 in Arizona, 580,000 in Pennsylvania, 1.2 million in Texas. Data is publicly available. HAVV allows voters to register with social security numbers and illegals are not able to get licenses there, but they can get social security cards for work authorization permits. Yeah, they'll probably be voting in our elections. So that's going to be fun. Teresa O. What's up, Teresa O. Thank you for becoming our supporter on the YouTubes. Facts matter. Hey, 19 months with a very nice honor says, thank you, Fax, for being a, an amazing Membo for 19 months. We love having you. Says, Membos in memory of my boy, Bodie. May that real good boy rest in peace. Hug your dog, my friends. No doubt about that. Rest in peace, Bodie. We're giving you belly rubs in heaven, my friend. We'll see you soon. Glocky McGlock says, the judge in New York is Fannie Willis times a thousand. Yeah, it's his daughter. It's the same story. Also corrupt. Glocky says, can't Elon give Trump a hand and unblock the accounts or give him the information on those accounts? Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. The daughter's stuff. Yeah, go get the daughter's DMs. Give it over to Trump, just like the FBI took Trump's DMs. Why, don't, why doesn't Elon get Lauren's DMs? Give those to Trump. It's fair, it's fair. Hey, T.A. Holloway. What's up, T.A. Holloway? He says, I'd like to know what threat President Trump actually made. He should have a perfect right, if not a responsibility, to point out bias and corruption. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, he's running for office. We want a, a leader who's going to create better, you know, better justice system. It's pretty important to us. So we expect him as part of his obligation is to 
expose this stuff, and he's doing a pretty dang good job of that. But there was no threat. He's just pointing out the simple corruption. That's all. Catherine Rex says, LOL, the judge's wife worked under Peekaboo James. I saw that reported too. Wife worked for Tish. Great. Hey, American Dreamer says, did you hear good logic might break the gag order? I did. And we're supporting good logic, man. We're at his back. He's in New York in the belly of the beast, baby. And we're here to support him. However we can do it. And so that is going to be a lot of fun. We'll be there right behind Joe. Hey, what's up, Jennifer? Jennifer brought in five new Membos. Jennifer, thank you for bringing in the new Membos. And they flew by our screen, so we don't know who you're bringing in. But my friends, if you got brought in by Jennifer, it might even feel like a mystery to you, but you know who you are. And we're grateful that you came in. And thank you, Jennifer, for being so gracious with your Membos. Look at this one from Facts Matter. Oh my goodness. It is a Bodie in heaven celebration in honor of Bodhi from Facts. Thank you, Facts. Look at this. 50 Membos coming in. Let's welcome in. Proxy Loxy, CO Bond, Man of Steel's here, GE, Villainy Fortitude, Dobre B, Lance Uppercut, was, I think it's what Guile said from Street Fighter, right? Jesusa Gonzalez, Queen B's Art Hive, we got Just Ranting, John's here, Dan F, Mike S, Donna M, Akbar, Mia J, DG, John S, War Mode Engaged, Mike B, Shelly C, Douglas T, Liberty, and Salty all got gifted Membos along with feline fun, which is very appropriate as we remember Bodhi. Maybe he's up there chasing some felines around. Hey, CK1 is here. Nick B, Carl W, Michael S, Thomas F, Motivational Humor and Happiness is here. Robert C, Michael B, Ecoms, Austin L, Matt H, James B, Bobby B, Michael H, Will P, XRP Panic, Natasha M, Melissa R, Fire Riel, Father and daughter in the house, Lysha L, Douglas D, Wojo, Very Scrog, and Evian. In the house, courtesy of our friend Fax Matter, 50 Membos. Oh my goodness, Fax, thanks for doing that. And we're grateful to have you as a Membo. And shout out to our friend Bodie in the house. Good to see you, Fax. Thanks again. Hey, Tony Hayes bringing in five more. Tony, you're the man. Brian R, Tazzy Wazzy's coming in. Jay Cali, Michael R, and Jop L, all here, courtesy of Tony Hay Munkets. We got Rob on Rumble, says, pay no attention to the girl behind the X curtain campaign account, Democrats hiding behind their children, Biden hiding behind Hunter. It's pathetic, isn't it? Supposed to be more honorable than your kids, not using your kids as human shields. Crash says, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb in the four pack, but I can't for the life of me see how the deep state can let Trump win. Implied in my statement is the clear fact that they, the deep state, control all aspects of the election. I'm getting ready for the worst possible event. Disabuse me of the notions, my notions if you can. I've seen plenty of dirty water pass under the bridge in my 76 years. Well, I don't know that I can. I mean, I, you know, I've sure, I certainly could make those arguments, but I think you're onto something. There is a real concern. We're watching it. I mean, we're covering it every day, Crash, right? You're here with us as we watch what they're doing. They're shattering all of the old norms in order to stop him. So it's concerning. Hey, hey, it's the Monkets is bringing in Membos. Nurse Cindy, Geneva H is here. Heather E, Jason I, and Robin M all coming in, courtesy of Tony Hey Monkets with more Membos. Hey, Catherine Rex says, I stand corrected. It was Mrs. Bragg. Uh, either way, a lot of people working for Tish over there. Sandy says, if we forget about all of the emotion behind the election steal and only focus on the money of their paychecks, we see our path to file a grievance with our state AG. If the presidential 2020 election was bad, the Congress was bad. They can't benefit from ill-gotten gains of fraud from Sandy over on Locals. Good to see you, Sandy says. Think about what these gag orders are really saying is the threat. If Trump speaks, what he says will anger people, and angry people might attack the corrupt people that Trump told them about. Angering people is not a reason to violate someone's First Amendment. These a-holes always anger me, and they are still free to speak. You're right. Yeah, and everyone's free to speak except Trump. 
Cohen can speak. Everybody can rant about Trump on Jen Psaki's show every night, but Trump can't respond. Troublemaker Jonas says, Judge Juan Mercon sounds, sounds exactly how I would, I would expect from a judge from a Bogota. What, what did um, uh, Bogota would sound? Oh, wait, he is from a Bogota. <laughs> Foreign election interference. He's from Colombia, right? Knox is here, says, Knox is the defense attorney in Texas, says, Happy Tuesday, all. When I went to the UA in the 90s, there was always at least one, quote, mall preacher screaming at us all about sin. Even my kids knew to just ignore him it was, as it was only words so long ago. UA, is that like University of Arizona? Yeah, they're always in the, yeah, at ASU, they were all over the place too. All over the place. Many Wheat says, Rob, so if they are worried about the attack on judicial integrity, then why does that not go both ways? If they say Trump's words will taint the public or jury, then why would the words of Alvin Bragg or everyone else that goes on the news outlets and calls Trump a psycho or sociopath or whatever they say regarding the case, how does that not taint the public or the jury also? You're right, Minnie Wheat. It is completely unfair. Trump is having his arms tied behind his back because they know that his words are effective because it's, it's, it's exposing truth that they don't want exposed. Manic Mutz is our newest supporter. Shout out to our friend Manic Mutz, who's joining us on the tubes. Mexican Marauder says, not sure if you caught this, but the tech said they had remote access to the voting machines. They testified that machines were not connected to the net. Yeah, I've heard that from multiple sources and multiple people that and multiple bits of evidence, right? That they were even updating some of these things over the air and nobody believes them, right? Nobody believes what they said, all fake. Troublemaker says, 2016 Secretary of State Kemp catches DHD jacking Georgia machines. 18 or 19 Kemp defeats, does he really? Stacey Abrams. Kemp says the 20 election was perfecto. Ryan Patrick's in the house. What's up, Ryan? Good to see you, my friend, with a great reminder, as always, from Ryan. Says, smash that like button, my friends. Thanks for doing that. Good to see you, Ryan. We got, hey, this old guy's on local says, great show, Rob. The community is the best. There's no question about that. This old guy, you're a part of it. And we're glad to have you. Gag says, I think all these people are realizing that their incompetence helped put the nation on the path of destruction. Well, you give them a lot of uh, benefit, Gag. I think that they're so incompetent that they don't even know what they're doing. Honestly, many of them. They just think that they're saving America from, you know, orange Hitler. And they don't realize that there's not going to be a country left for them to inherit. Now, NY says, I am not an unbiased voter. I wonder if the Republican PACs, rather than Trump, should create a TV internet ad summarizing the voting problems. There was enough to elect Trump. I'm torn on whether even bringing it up would help or hurt Trump, giving all the lies of the MSM. Yeah, I don't know. I think the downside, I think the thing that Republicans are concerned about is that if you blast the voting, Republicans may not vote, right? Like you don't want to dissuade your own side from getting involved. Like we're all voting, even though our election officials are corrupt a-holes, swear jar, we still are voting and we're going to vote hard, even harder than 2020. Glocky's talking, sharing this one from Patrick Webb saying the U.S. military started recalling veteran retirees. I saw a video about that also. Yeah, I saw something about that from someone who said he got recalled. Voice of the people, nice voice, thank you, says, bit of a black pill here. People think that suing people over corruption, we will see work. How can you use lawfare if it's actively working against you? We have the right to alter or abolish a tyrannical government. government. It's beyond time for that. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty hard, you know, when they control the levers of power, it's pretty hard to to win, right? Like you can sue, right? Like Trump can sue Dominion, but he goes into the courts, which are obviously not in favor of Trump winning a lawsuit like that. So how do you overcome that? I think it is, you know, it's why we're fighting hard to I think regain the levers of power so that we can reestablish the the norms that America knew and loved before they broke all the glass for their emergency voice. Thank you for being a membo. Thanks for the nice dono today. We got E Harris says, speaking of social credit, a segment at the Epoch times talks about this it says America, Americans quietly assign China like social credit scores. 
I'm, I, I think that's absolutely true, right? With your spending and all the things. Maid is here, says federal judge said illegal aliens can possess firearms, but does the first question on an ATF form to purchase firearms ask if you are an illegal alien? If you answer yes, you are denied a right to purchase. You know, I don't know. I filled out that form many times, but I don't know. I never really thought about that question because I'm not an illegal alien. You know, I, most of those you just go down the list. Use illegal drugs? No, no, no. Any warrants? No, you know, any outstanding? No. So yeah, curious. Hey, what's up? We got a bad poet says, great show. I can just imagine Kamala and Shifty sitting in a political company office meeting asking, how can we get Trump? Someone says, my daddy's a judge. Timing of his appointment and job, boom. All the pieces fall into place. So thank you for that one, a bad poet. And yeah, this is something. So Milo phone bill says there's no reason a voting machine should ever have Wi-Fi on it. Wi-Fi can be hacked. And that is a device that looks like that might be what that does. I agree, right? There's security concerns, a lot of security concerns. Amy Totenberg wrote about that in her, uh, her election order about Georgia. Sandy says the gag order on Trump is no more effective than a gag order on the mainstream media. If Trump can incite violence, so can the mainstream media. Judge has no personal jurisdiction over the media, so file a complaint with your state AG if the media promotes speech that could incite. And what are our AGs going to do? It's, you know, it's a good point, but you have to have some AGs who have some stones and care about playing this battle. Democrats long for this fight. They love using government to take out their opponents. It's their whole, you know, MO. So Republicans just don't play that game, generally speaking. All right, so we got some great comments here in the House. Russ says, shifts payments to Lauren's account on a monthly average were $168,000 from Russ. Damien says the judge, by trying this case, unethically enriches his daughter. There's no other way to look at it. No doubt. Great comment. Fred says, I keep saying this. The self-recusal crap has to end. There has to be another way to deal with these biased judges. What's up, Angie? Good to see you. Salty says Trump was up 75,000 votes in Georgia and then down the next seven days. His vote totals went down until he was down by 11K. I remember that. Yeah, Damie, I did. I mentioned Laura Loomer a couple times today. Thank you for, for flagging her too, though. Thank you, Robert, for your work. I appreciate it all. And thank you, X This. Great to see you. James Pepper says, can any of the information sent out by the daughter and Judge Ann Cohen, is it privileged testimony or can that evidence be used at trial? Well, it, uh, it's not privileged, but the, uh, the judge would say it's not relevant to the criminal charges against Trump. And so it shouldn't be allowed. Sunshine says you always do a great job, Robert, keep up the good work. And I really appreciate you and your positive attitude. Well, thank you, sunshine. You know, it's easy to be positive around positive and amazing people. It's just easy. It just comes here. Everybody's so nice and pleasant around here. I have no choice but to be nice because you're all so nice. So that my friends is going to be it for us on the day we got Tony Hay with five new Membos. Tony, thank you. JF is coming in. Eagle's coming in. Joel's coming in. Melody and Jackson S. all in the house. So we're grateful to have you. Thank you, Tony Hay. And John McGarvey says, yeah, the picture, this is from NY, the picture showed is a hacking device. Oh, that's not good. Well, hopefully it's legal. And Jennifer says, hey, thank you for another great show, Rob. The Watching the Watchers community rocks. Amen to that, Jennifer. You're right about it. You're a part of it. So thanks for, thanks for making it what it is. And so thank you so much, my friends, for joining us. Locals is available. Just You can download the Locals app. You can also go to watchingthewatchers.locals.com to come and join us. That's where we're going right now for our debrief. And so we'd love to see you there. Reminders, we got robertgovea.com for the newsletter, the PDFs, the calendar, and more. Watcherlodge.com, which is where we've got still our Living with Meaning and Purpose Masterclass, which is a two-hour masterclass. It's a quarter, it's quarter two. So if you're looking for a jumpstart on a new quarter, you wanna get things going, 
go to watcherlodge.com and check out the Living with Meaning and Purpose Masterclass. It's there, it's free, it's you know all available. So check it out. Before we wrap it up, we want to thank our mods and our meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things nice and orderly. Our friends, Vienti Kiss, K Bean, Just Cause, Playin' Hooky, Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, we got Janek, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me modding down the fort for us and clipping hard for us. Thank you to Donut and John McGarvey for helping keep the show on the track today. We got Sleepy Dog Lee and KB for modding for us, playing hookies in the mod chat. Good to see you guys. We got Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Gigum Gigum, all us are meme smiths, but that, my friends, is it for us on the day. And we are going to leave it right there, but we're going to come back here tomorrow. It's going to be Wednesday, hump day, middle of the week, and we're going to have a lot of business to attend to. And in order to do that properly, we're going to need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.